All right, start us up. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Welcome to the Broken Mirror Story Event. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. That malfunctioning little twerp. And Big Anklevich. I'm saved. And I'm an outer man. How rude. God save the king. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 90. I am one of your hosts, Rish Outfield. And I'm the other host, Big Anklevich. Thanks for coming back. Today we have the third of our three Broken Mirror Story event finalists. That's right. Today we have May He Reign Forever by Nathaniel Lee. Once again, these were stories written based on our premise. It's a little contest a few months ago. And uh, this one, I guess, is the winner. This was the one that got the highest scores, the most... The average, that's the word. They got the highest average score when they took everybody and you add them together and you divide by how many. That's how it works. All right. I'll, or should I be taking notes? <laughs> of course, because we will be tested. About the author. Nathaniel Lee is a former English teacher working at a hotline in Charlotte, North Carolina. He writes words in various orders and arrangements. He has an upcoming story, Concrete, coming from Abyss and Apex in 2011. And he recently won the Flash Fiction Contest at Podcastle with his story, Fetch. He can most easily be found at Mirror Shard, where he publishes a 100-word story every day. Oh, he's that guy. Yeah. To date, five of those stories have appeared on the Drabblecast, and hopefully many more to come. We'd like to thank Eric J. Blommel, Rich Girardi, and Josh Roseman for lending their voices to today's story. Today's music is by Matthias Westlund and by Zero Project. And you can check out links to everything in the show notes. May he reign forever by Nathaniel Lee. The crown was a glorious thing, all gold and jewels and intricate carvings. Four royal animals were featured in the engravings, a crocodile and a bulky river horse gazing worshipfully up from beneath the spread wings of a grand ibis. The centerpiece, however, and the focus of the other three animals' attention, was a life-size carving of a grand scorpion, the width of a man's spread-fingered hand, so richly detailed that it almost seemed to move as the light passed across it. It was truly a magnificent crown, weighing several pounds in all. It slipped unsteadily past the brow of the new king and caught on his protruding ears. He staggered under the unexpected weight. Beshat, the high priest, turned to the crowd and lifted his hands. All hail Aramanu Fatan the Great, keeper of the sun gate and opener of the doors of water, guardian of the seven kingdoms, and scion of the blood of the god king Zu. May, May he reign forever. A murmur of voices chanted the traditional response in almost perfect unison. They were getting a lot of practice at this ceremony lately. Aram pushed the crown back on his head and grinned his gap-toothed smile. He was ten years old today, and it was the best birthday ever. It wasn't quite so much fun the next morning. Aram's head hurt because Beishat made him actually drink the honey wine every time there was a toast, and all of the nobles had wanted to make a toast to Aram's long life and longer reign. Awake, O shining one, said Harum, pulling aside the curtains of Aram's enormous bed. 
We have much to do today. Harum smiled down at Aram. With his beaky mouth and long, bobbing neck, he looked like nothing so much as a shellless turtle, a contrast to his master Bayshat's toad-like features. What's that? Why, your duties, my lord and mighty master. Harum fussed around the edges of Aram's bedclothes. Touching the king was punishable by death, even for a priest. There is the song of greeting the rising sun, and then the opening of the door and the cleansing of the river weeds. And after that, we must finish the rituals from yesterday to ensure your soul takes root in the new soil of divinity in which it finds itself. Aram rubbed at his slightly bloodshot eyes. When's breakfast? Your worshipfulness, we cannot possibly eat while more vital spiritual matters require attendance. It would be shockingly disgraceful. There was a silence as Aram squinted at Harum in the pre-dawn light. Harum endeavored to appear cheerful and earnest. Fine, said Aram. Give me my crown. Harum obediently went to the small stand on which the sacred relic rested, while its divine bearer slept away the dark of the sun. He lifted it cautiously. The carvings had far too many points and sharp edges for his taste. After this is breakfast, right? Asked Aram, as Harum settled the crown on his head. Well, these and the dance of the gracious request, so the ibis will carry your wishes for the, the spring flood to the mud walkers at the doors of water. We must make the request every morning for the next thirty days to ensure the mud walkers here. Then breakfast? More like lunch, O oh glorious beacon. The days passed in an endless series of dances, songs, chants, and rituals. As the king, Aram was responsible for everything from the weather to the mood of the gods, and Harum and Bayshut promised terrible consequences if Aram failed to complete everything with the utmost precision. Aram was yawning by the time the slaves began brushing his fine cotton robes for another feast. His scorpion crown rested on its stand nearby. I'm not hungry, he told them. Put it away. But you must attend your incandescence, said Bayshat. All of the nobles of the kingdom will be there awaiting you, wishing to bask in your presence. Are these the same people who were there yesterday? Of course, Lord. Then they saw me already. But what of the feast? cried Harum. Your incomparableness, he added quickly. Give it to someone who's hungry, said Aram. He yawned again. Those guys from yesterday are fat. They don't need food. Go find some people in the city and give it to them instead. O oh, branch of divinity, Bishat began, but Aram cut him off. I'm going to bed, Aram announced. He hopped from his stool and trotted to his private chambers. Harum and Bishat shared a glance and ushered the servants out. I'm sure he's just overwhelmed, said Bishat, his bulging eyes watering. He'll be better tomorrow. Maybe we should cut back on the rituals, Harum suggested. No, no, we have to keep him busy. I'm sure he'll adjust quickly. His father didn't. Bayshat looked down what nose he had. Surely you're not suggesting the king of kings was not fathered by the gods themselves. But no, sir, Harum said, swallowing heavily. So long as that's clear. Your job is to keep the little brat all tuckered out and away from anything important. The previous king... May he reign forever. Managed to do considerable damage to our finances before he was so unkindly taken from us. I'd hate to have to go through that trauma again. Am I understood? As clear as the waters of the land of Reed, sir. Franz waved and incense smoked as Aram shifted uncomfortably in his stone seat. When the last of the acolytes had carried their golden platters of sacrificial foods past Aram for him to sanctify with three shakes of the sacred rod, Harum sidled up to the throne. We're ahead of schedule, O oh blissful radiance, so we'll have time for a refreshing drink before your walk through the menagerie to bless the animals with health and fruitfulness. Aram pouted. Why... Without the blessings of the gods, all creatures would wither and perish, O benevolent one, said Harum. The gods can bless the animals then, said Aram. He scooted forward and dropped to the floor. I want to go outside. But you cannot, my lord. Aram halted in mid-step. 
Harum froze. No, said Aram. No, I don't think that's how it works. I think you have to do what I say. I'm the king, right? Uh, of course, so ruler of all. And you, are you the king? No, Lord. Then we're going outside, Aram said, smiling a tight smile that was not much like his wide grin of only a few days before. What's that? Aram pointed to a plume of smoke. The smelting works, old bastion of knowledge. Why is the road so bumpy? It has not been repaired, O oh keen-eyed one. The municipal funds have not stretched to road repair for many months. That's stupid. What's that? Harum peered ahead, his eyes weak in the bright light. That is your grand tomb, O ever-living king. You will rule there in eternity amid gold and jewels and all the finery in the land. They began work the day you were born. I want to see it. Harum gestured to the driver, and the chariot turned onto another street, hardly less uneven and potholed than the first. They came to the large pit, where walls were just beginning to climb above the ground. Already the pattern of tunnels was apparent and dizzying in its complexity. Workers hauled enormous rocks into position. Nearby, more men worked to carve the blocks to the correct shape, while others shaped stones into more delicate carving, statues representing guardians, servants, and valuables for placement in the tomb, where they would serve Aram in the afterlife. Aram hopped out of the chariot before it fully stopped, leaving Harum to scramble after him. The boy's coppery skin was pale in comparison to the sun-scorched shoulders and backs of all the men around him. Silence spread across the work area as more and more men recognized the chariot and realized who was among them. A slow wave of kneeling and prostrating spread out from Aram like ripples in a puddle. What happened to your hand? Aram asked, pausing in front of a large-backed brute. The man wore a belt of sacred crocodile skin, marking him as a foreman or other leader. His right hand was a fist, shaped of solid steel. Even as Harum puffed up behind Aram, the worker brought his arm up and down sharply on a chisel held against the rock, his metal fist serving as an admirable hammer. Beside him, the bench held a carved chariot, a pair of lions, and a peacock with flared feathers. The worker put down his chisel and turned to regard the diminutive king. Recognition sparked in his eyes, but he did not kneel. My hand was cut off. Why? I touched the king's chariot when it passed. Oh. Well, it wasn't me. I've only been king for a few days. The man hesitated. Harum took the opportunity to interject. Why are you not bowing down, dog? Prostrate yourself before the unveiled glory of the ever-rising sun. What? Don't be silly, Harum, Aram said. He turned back to the worker. Did you make all of these? What's your name? My name is Ket, and yes, I made these. I cannot lift and carry, so I am left to the carving. Ket shrugged. It is less grueling, but requires more skill. These are great, Aram said, poring over the carvings. I like him, Harum. I want him to come back with us. Do you want a job at the palace, Ket? Ket glanced at Harum, who shook his head firmly in the negative. Ket smiled. I would be honored, my king. Great! So, what's all this for, anyway? It is for your glory in the afterlife, O oh, son of heaven, Harum said, glaring at Ket. This tomb will be a palace in your honor, and you will rule here eternally. Oh, that's stupid. I'm not going to die for ages. What do I need a tomb for while I'm still alive? Hold on. I'll fix it. Ket, help me up. Aram pointed to the workbench. Ket held out his steel hand and shrugged at Harum, who was sputtering incoherently. Aram grasped the false limb and scrambled onto the table. Attention! Called Aram, cupping his hands around his mouth. Attention, everybody! He hardly need have bothered. The worksite was almost completely still, with all eyes on the king. I don't want a tomb anymore. You're all going to work on the roads because I'm not dead yet. And because the roads are really bad. Everyone stop building this right now and go make better roads instead. Aram looked for the official royal slave drivers. You guys. He pointed. Do you know how to make roads? 
The uniformed men paled and shook their heads. Oh, well, who does? A handful of slaves put up their hands, trembling with fear. Okay, great. You're in charge now. Get to work, everyone. There was a long, frozen moment as slaves and slave drivers stared at one another. Ket restrained a smile as Aram crouched and reached a cautious sandal for the ground. You are a practical man, my king. Around them, the hubbub was rising. The road made my butt hurt. I'd rather have that fixed in some stupid tune. Aram squinted up at Cat. You're still coming with me to the palace, right? I'll make you a royal artificer or something. You're too good to be working on roads. I will gladly come, my king, but if I may ask one boon. Certainly. Aram waved a negligent hand. My people have worked long on your tomb. How can I leave them to labor in the hot sun without food or drink and without pay? What? They don't get paid? Aram thought about this. Oh, I guess they are slaves. Well, I can probably fix part of that. Harum? Yes, so munificent one. Harum sounded as though we were trying to swallow a river frog. Take all the money that we were going to use to build this stupid tomb thing and use it to make sure the workers get enough food and water and any extra goes to their families and stuff. That's in order, understand? With blinding clarity, O bearer of the sevenfold blessing. Someone needs to make sure things go smoothly. You'd better get this place organized, Harum, said Aram, finally seeming to notice the rising tide of chaos around them. I want them working on the roads by tomorrow morning at least. Come on, Ket. We need to find you a room in a new uniform. Harum watched the chariot depart. Despite the heat of the day, he felt quite cold. But Bashat, what was I to do? The king, may he reign forever, gave very explicit instructions. The king, may he reign forever, is a child, Harum. Bashat's jowls wobbled as he shook his head in dismay. He's cost us uncounted amounts gold and several tons of building material. And all because you let him run his mouth in public. If it were just the one slave that knew, we'd just have him killed. But now... We can't be seen as countermanding the orders of the king, so his ridiculous commands will have to be obeyed. In the future, Harom, you will distract him at all costs. Try diversions if duty isn't working. A ride on the river, or a game of some kind. He waved a vague hand in the air. If you can't manage to keep a ten-year-old out of trouble, well, the sacred crocodiles are always hungry. Bayshut pointed to the riverbank, where the long, dark shapes lurked, somnolent and slow-moving in the chill of the night. Harum swore he saw one of the cold, reptilian eyes wink at him, like a flash of gold in candlelight. Ket was installed by Aram's side the next day, clad in a loose robe of light cotton, closed with his crocodile skin belt. His fist was freshly polished and it gleamed in the sunlight that filled the chamber. Somehow that gleam held Harum's attention, more solidly than the troop of nubile dancers who bowed and swayed in what should have been a most distracting manner. Aram, true to form, appeared bored by the proceedings pushing at his crown every time it threatened to slide from his head. A sudden sound from outside distracted the boy, and he hopped from the throne and padded across the floor, narrowly avoiding the flying limbs of the dancers. The music stuttered, but the performance carried on gamely. A procession! Aram called from the window. Who are those people? <clears throat> Harum cleared his throat. The dance is not yet finished, O oh, cup of the waters of life. Ket walked over to stand beside Aram. Those are the Hidaros, my king. They are a barbarian tribe from a neighboring land. My people once traded with them before we became part of the kingdom. I like their hair, said Aram. Why doesn't anyone here have long hair like that? Only women and cowards wear their hair long, Harum said, his lip curling unconsciously. We bear our scalps to the sun, from whom all life and power flows, and are enriched thereby. Oh, said Aram. 
Why are they here? Does it matter, O oh, patron of sweetness? Harum's voice took on a wheedling tone. How does a fishing expedition down the river sound? I'm sure there will be cool breezes by the water. They are likely here to discuss the war, said Cat. We're at war? Aram's eyes sparkled. Why didn't anyone tell me? I want to talk to them. Oh, bud of the tree of life, it is hardly my humble place to object, but truly I... You're right, said Aram. It isn't. Come on, let's go. The music master cast a desperate look at Harum as the king dashed out of the room, one hand steadying his heavy gold crown while the other kept his skirt off the floor. Ket paced ponderously behind him, massive arms swinging. Harum made a brief spinning motion with his hands. Keep going, he mouthed. I'll be right back. And you come before us now with your laughable demands. Ha! Beishet slapped his copious belly, sending visible waves across it. You should count yourself lucky I do not have your heathen heads hung from the gate of the palace as trophies. Take your stinking bodies and go back to your mountains before the king arrives to dispatch you himself. The king's already here. What's dispatch mean? Asked Aram. Ket held the door open for him as he padded inside. Hello. He called to the Hideros envoy. I like your hair. Lord. Beishet coughed. What are you doing here? I had thought you were occupied. I was just getting rid of some trouble. A child? Said the Hideros envoy, a man nearly as tall as Ket, clad in the tanned fur of some immense predator. Its claws adorned his neck. What nonsense is this? Where is the real king? This can all be explained. I am the real king, said Aram, cutting him off. What have you been telling these people? He's throwing us out is what he's been doing, snarled the envoy. And with only the authority of a boy, not even old enough to shave. My lord, this is just some dull matter of state. Hardly worth your time, and... Wait, 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 Aram said, holding up his arms. It's too noisy in here with everyone talking. Bay shut. Go outside and wait. I want to talk to the Hidraris. Hideros, Cat supplied. Yeah, these guys. Just me and the leader. Everyone else, out. But... You can't. Harum burst in, wheezing. <sighs> oh, oh, child of golden light, please come. Cat? The freshly minted royal artificer stepped to the side of the doorway and gestured with his good hand. The king has spoken, he said quietly. Beishat and Harum glanced at each other, then at the Hederos. The Hederos leader watched both priests closely. At last, Beishet folded his hands and bowed, and stalked, stiff-legged, out of the room. The Hideros leader nodded to his followers, and the half-dozen barbarians followed Beishet, trailed by the guards, Harum, and lastly, Ket, who stationed himself outside the door and folded his arms over his barrel chest. He can't keep us out here, said Beishet. Ket said nothing. We could have you executed, Beishet told him. Cat raised an eyebrow. I wonder what they're talking about, said Harum. Beishat rounded on the thinner priest. You, you are supposed to be keeping him out of trouble. How dare you let him... <clears throat> Cat coughed and nodded his head at the Hideros, who were watching this exchange with great interest. Harum tugged at a ceremonial pendant of office. There's a fine display of artistry and music just along the hallway here and across the way, he said. Why don't we all watch the dancing girls until the king comes back out? Beishet had continued to pace and growl throughout the remainder of the performance. And as soon as he could, he fled back to the hallway to glare daggers at Ket and mumble curses. Harum babbled apologies to the still suspicious Hideros. Ket stared at nothing in particular, a small smile turning up the corners of his mouth. After far too long, the door opened again and Aram padded out. That was easy, he said. You wouldn't believe what the problem was, Beishat. They just wanted some bit of land up in the mountains. That's what this fight was all about. The silver mines, Beishat mumbled. Well, that part's all fixed now, right, Kiko? Aram glanced up at the fur-cloaked leader. 
As you say, your majesty. Beishat looks stricken. Harum was pale. You'll be leaving us then, Beishat asked Kiko. For now, the barbarian responded. The first carts will be coming in the spring. Carts? Turns out, Aram piped up. They've got trading connections all over, but they can't get to them because the roads are blocked because of the fighting. So they'll take the silver out and sell it and bring back all kinds of things. Then they pay us for the silver and our roads and stuff. Your king drives a hard bargain, Kiko said. By my reckoning, your kingdom will be better off than it was even under the old pacts before you broke them. But to end the fighting, it is a price we will pay. We have to make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen again, said Aram. Do you know how much money we are losing this whole time? Even more than we were spending on that stupid tomb I wasn't using. That's why some of the Hideros are going to come live here. Here, squeaked Harum. And we'll send someone to live with them. I thought this up all by myself. If people talk more, we can keep it so we don't end up fighting again in a few years. You want an embassy for the Hideros? Beishat said. Kiko grinned, displaying crooked teeth. You may find we are more civilized than you give us credit for. He turned and bowed deeply to Aram. It is a pleasure to speak with you, King Aramanu Phaeton. Truly, you are a new dawn for your people. You too, Kiko. This is going to be great. Aram handed a damp length of papyrus to Harum. Here, make sure I spelled everything right. Now, I'm going outside. He headed for the door, Ket trailing stolidly behind. An oil lamp burned softly in the window, the flame trailing now this way, now that, as Beishat paced furiously. This has to stop. He's going to destroy the kingdom. Everything we've worked so hard to build. Actually, the trade agreement is not bad at all, said Haru. It really is at least as good as we used to get in tribute. Maybe better. How he talked that stone-headed barbarian into signing, I wish I knew. Irrelevant, Beishat barked. Maybe Kiko is as bad at mathematics as he is at hygiene. Or maybe it's all some sort of cunning plan of attack. Or maybe the child simply got lucky. We can't have him charging around like a rutting rhinoceros, demolishing everything he touches. He must go. We can't crown another king so soon, Harum said. We are running out of royal family members. Something rustled at the window, and Harum glimpsed a black feathered head and white wings. One of the ibises from the sacred garden was roosting on the ledge. Beisha ignored it, resuming his pacing. Then we will concoct a new plan. Maybe it's time we took the reins ourselves. The temples have run everything for the past two dynasties anyway. Harum gasped. <gasps> that is treason, Lord Beishat, and blasphemy. To the uttermost reaches of the desert of souls with your blasphemy, Beishat said. The child is dangerous. He is a thorn in our paw, and you will pluck him out. Tomorrow. Harum turned away from Beishat, not wanting to show fear or hesitance in the face of the fat priest's anger. The window was empty. Where did it go? He asked involuntarily. Where did what go? The sacred ibis. There was one outside the window a moment ago. Beishat snorted. As if it weren't bad enough that we spend all day at the temple ankle-deep in bird shit. Now they're following me to my quarters? If the gods exist, they're doing all they can to test the limits of my patience. Harum said nothing about Beishat's further blasphemies and he let his master ramble on about the daily horrors visited upon him by an uncaring world. Harum's attention was caught by a single white feather that remained on the window sill, as if in silent recrimination. No, not white. It glinted golden in the lamplight. Harum moved to pick it up and examine it, but with a gust of cold night air, it was gone. Aram was oddly pliant the next morning. He ate his morning meal without complaint, answered Harum's monosyllabic offerings with voluble chatter, and even inquired with apparent earnestness what new duties they had to fulfill that day. 
Arum had been up most of the night mulling over the task Beishad had set him to. Even if he were inclined toward regicide and infanticide, which he would have insisted emphatically that he was not, he had no experience to draw upon, no idea how such a thing might even be accomplished. Beishat had been no help, full of dark hints and muttered imprecations, but little in the way of practical advice. You have been junior too long, Beishat had told him. It's time you took some real responsibility for the well-being of the kingdom. Harum had decided at last to simply put himself in likely places and wait for opportunity and inspiration to strike simultaneously. I was thinking we might go for a ride down the river later, said Aram. You were so interested in that yesterday. The river. Crocodiles, sunstroke, drowning. A veritable cornucopia of possible hazards presented themselves. That, oh many-winged son of morning said Harum from beneath dark ringed eyes. Sounds like a wonderful idea. It was cooler down by the water, though only in relative terms. The coppery disk of the sun still kept the air hot enough to bake bricks. In the shade of a pavilion on the slow-moving barge, Harum battered his sleep-deprived brain for topics of conversation. Aram did most of the talking. So this is the part you can't swim in, right? Why is that? The waters are deep here, vessel of righteousness, and the current is slow. Isn't that good for swimming? And also for crocodiles, said Ket, moving for the first time since they'd boarded the boat to point at several outwardly unremarkable bumps and sticks near the riverbank. Ket had foregone the shade, but he wasn't even sweating. Aram snorted. They wouldn't bother me. I'm the king. They're my sacred animals. Them and the river horses. He pointed to his elaborate crown, which shone like a second sun. I know that, and you know that, said Cat. But who has told the crocodiles? Best to stay in the boat for now. Boring. Aram crossed his arms in a sulk. Harum, make something interesting happen. Perhaps we might induce the crocodiles to feed. Harum said carefully. By giving them scraps. They are quite terrifying when they are roused. Terrifying is good, said Aram. He ran to the edge of the raised dais and peered out into the murky water. So throw some food in already. Harum gestured to one of the servants who watched over their picnic repast, meant for the end of their journey, and gathered up some of the dried fish from the proffered platter. We will try to attract their attention, he said, moving up behind Aram as casually as he could. The first few throws gained nothing but some ripples on the surface. But then, Harum landed a fishy missile squarely atop one of the submerged reptiles. There was a snap and a splash of water that made Aram squeal happily. And then several more quiet sounds as dark shapes slipped into the water from every direction. Ripples converged on the royal barge. They're all coming! Aram cried. Throw some more! Throw some more! Harum summoned the servant for another few handfuls of fish. He watched the man approach with bated breath. Timing would be everything for this. A sudden clumsiness, a brief nudge, and both king and servant would fall into the agitated water. And what could Harum have done? The gods were cruel to take away one so young and full of promise, were they not? In a few more moments. Two steps. One step. Crack! Something slammed into the side of the barge with tremendous force, rocking the whole edifice. Harum, one foot lifted, prepared to trip the platter-bearing servant, was thrown off balance. His arms windmilled as he staggered backwards, spun and stumbled. Time seemed to slow, and he saw a dozen scaly backs swirling in the waters below him. A dozen sets of beady eyes watched him greedily. And off to the side, where the terrible sound had come from, a flash of yellow reflected sunlight from the back of an enormous river horse, a god among beasts. It looked to Harun's desperate senses to be made entirely of gold. A strong arm caught the back of Harun's loose robe, and he heard the thin cloth tear. His arms flailed for purchase, his hands closing around a cold metal sphere that hauled him back up onto the boat. Harum looked down at the steel fist in his hands. 
then up at the unsmiling face of Ket. That was a close one, said Aram from one side. You almost fell in. Yes, said Ket. And now he did smile, a slow and dangerous grin. We must all be more careful when we taunt the sacred crocodiles. His good hand strayed to his crocodile skin belt and hitched it up. They are hungry and they do not care if a man is a slave or a priest. Harum's mouth worked, but no sound came out. All of his limbs suddenly felt made of water, and he collapsed to the still rocking deck of the boat, his vision narrowing to a black tunnel. The last thing he heard was Aram's piping voice. You spilled all the rest of the fish in, Harum. Now what can we feed the crocodiles? It was dark, and Bayshut moved through the palace with a grace that belied his bulk. That worthless idiot Harum had failed, done nothing more than give himself heat stroke. He was even now lying in his quarters near the temple, babbling about golden animals and pursuing crocodiles. And the look that unspeakable man Ket had given him! If Bayshut hadn't known better... He would have sworn the horrible miscreant was laughing at him, winking about some private game they were playing between them, as if Bayshut would lower himself to that, as if Ket could even keep up with him. No, there comes a time, as there always seemed to these days, when a man had to take matters into his own hands. Bayshut had removed the last king, Aram's drunkard father, after one too many drug-addled prostitutes had come to the temple for hush money with claims of a bastard in her belly. The gods only knew how he'd ever managed to father Aram, with his queen constantly sequestered in her tower, and him spreading his seed to the four winds. Bayshut had assisted in the previous king's removal too, the crazed old man grown too erratic to keep on the throne any longer. Bayshut had been left to stand watch while the older priests carried out their work, but he'd learned the secret ways of the royal suite regardless, just in case. Today that knowledge served him well. He slipped from the hidden passageway to the antechamber of Aram's bedroom with barely a whisper of cotton against stone, and the guards outside the suite none the wiser for all their torches and patrols. Beisha took a moment in the relative brightness of the antechamber to ready his weapon, a slender tube the length of his arm, and a small dart made of a scorpion's sting and a bit of thread wound into a ball. It was a cunning device, nearly silent and, for a clever man, virtually undetectable afterward. The stinger was a common enough sight, leaving unremarkable wounds, and the thread unraveled easily afterward. The soft sounds of a child snoring emanated from the next room, and Bayshut lifted the blowgun to his lips and crept forward on soundless feet. He should kill her room, too, lest the blathering fool let the secret slip. That was a task for another day, alas. Best to focus on the pleasures of the present. Aram had been nothing but an annoyance since the day he was born, a sullen and cold-eyed child. At least he'd lost the distressing wheat-colored hair and eyes he'd had as a baby, likely an artifact of his foreign mother's weak blood. Now he was unremarkable in appearance, and his attitude too much of an obstacle. The light from the hallway was fainter here, barely enough to let him make out the bed and the dark form within. Glints of gold and jewels caught Bayshut's eye as he moved in, unwilling to risk a failed shot. All the treasures of the Seven Kingdoms, and the boy had thrown it all away for his pointless recalcitrance. Bayshut wondered what it would be like to wear that massive golden crown, even just for a day. That thought sparkled a realization that something was wrong, but Bayshut was another two steps into the bedroom before he realized what it was. He backtracked quickly and peered into the gloom. Golden Scorpion was missing from the top of the crown. Only flat, 
bare metal showed above the ibis's spread wings. It reflected the light quite cleanly. Bayshut felt sweat spring out on his forehead. Harum had whispered about golden animals he'd spotted everywhere, convinced that an ibis had warned Ket of the treachery and sent a river horse to jostle the boat and ruin his plan. Had the madman been right? Bayshut cast his eyes about the darkened room. A golden scorpion would stand out even in the dimness, would it not? The light reflecting from all the points and angles of its body, that razor-sharp tail raised and quivering. Bayshut heard a rustle from his left and whirled about to face it. There! Motion! He staggered backward, away from the threat. By the time he realized it was only a polished copper mirror, it was too late. He felt the prickly sting on his ankle, felt his linen skirt catch on something spiky and metallic. And as he fell, he gasped in shock and inhaled. Course. He wheezed, feeling the sting and spreading numbness of his own dart on his tongue. You win this time. He managed to spit at whatever gods might be listening. And then there was silence. Feeling much better, oh golden one, which is why, merciful gods! Harum stopped short on the threshold upon seeing Bayshut's unmoving bulk. He's dead! Aram yawned and sat up in the bed. He peered out through the diaphanous veils. Oh, that. It's only Bayshut. But, 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 he's dead? Harum couldn't keep his eyes off Bayshut's corpse as Aram swung his legs out and gestured pointedly at the toiletry kit. Of course he's dead, said Aram. He kept getting in the way. It was bound to happen sooner or later. Are you going to help me get dressed or not? Harum backed away slowly, but stopped when he ran into a large, warm bulk behind him. He glanced up. Ket grinned down at him. Ket, called Aram. Go get some people to take away Bayshut before he starts to smell bad. Or worse than he already does, anyway. As you wish, my king. Ket rumbled. He raised his right hand to acknowledge Aram's instructions, and the polished steel gleamed in the morning sun. Tell Harum to either come help me get ready, or find some servants who can do it without getting all their hands chopped off afterward. Aram appeared in the doorway, his crown under his arm. It, too, shone in the sunlight, golden and sparkling. Harum was frozen, trapped between the two of them. He glanced from one to the other, and saw the same savage, joyful grin on both faces. We've got a lot to do, Aram told him. We're only just beginning. And now, a word about today's story. I've always loved writing from prompts. Tell me to you know, write anything you want, and I'll just sort of stare blankly at you. But you give me a few words to build on, and I'm all over that like stink on a durian. Which is why I was so intrigued when the Doonstief started the Broken Mirrors event shortly after I started listening regularly. As I'm sure many entrants did, I immediately started looking for a weird, roundabout way to interpret the prompt in order to give a unique spin to my story. Yes, I was always that kid, the one who couldn't just do the project. My teachers either loved me or hated me. Anyway, eventually I decided to keep the first part literal, the crowning of the king, as the child as the king, and take the game part a little vaguely, so I knew there'd be some reason why the crowning wasn't serious, but that it wouldn't involve any actual games. I started with the image of a boy king being crowned, and basically if you say boy king to anyone who's ever listened to Dr. Demento, the immediate association is King Tut by, um, Steve Martin? Hold on, let me Google. Yeah, Steve Martin and the Toot Uncommons, apparently. Hmm. 
So anyway, that meant my story was now Egyptian, or at least vaguely Egypt flavored. Uh, if you notice any rampant inaccuracies, that's because my knowledge of Egypt is a bare minimum of 15 years old, uh, plus a quick skim of the Wikipedia article to make sure that hippopotamuses were actual fauna of Egypt. I think the, uh, the last thing about Egypt I really got involved with was the Egypt game back in sixth grade. Admittedly, a pretty fun book, and I can totally empathize with building elaborate secret forts as a form of escapism. Anyway, it's not actual Egypt. It's alternate fantasy world that just kind of happens to resemble Egypt. So there. Uh, that's about it on for this story. Not that I have uh, other stories published for people to compare this one to, but it's got a lot of what I laughably call my hallmarks. Uh, I love ambiguity, so avoiding answering the question of whether the gods actually were intervening was important to me. Uh, I also tend to favor, favor protagonists in the uh, 11 to 13 year old range. And I like to blend funny with creepy. My favorite reaction to get is, ha <laughs> ha, Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the story. <laughs> Ew. Welcome back. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sticking around, folks. That was our winner, Nathaniel Lee. May he reign forever. <laughs> Even though he doesn't like us, he won fair and square. And that brings our Broken Mirror event to an end for another year. But, you know, I totally understand what he was talking about in that author's note, where somebody gives you a directive, gives you a specific thing that you need to write about. And for some reason, that unlocks my imagination, too, in a way that, okay, you've got an hour to write about anything you want does not. Uh huh. It's definitely hard without some sort of a something to get started with. If you've got an idea already, then yeah, you can go from there. But if you've got nothing, it's definitely easy if somebody says, write this with this and this from, and that yeah, it does help. Yeah, we got quite a few entrants in this little game. I don't know. Was it? Would you say it was more than just a game? <laughs> and, and hopefully people enjoyed that whole, you know, here's your premise, run with it kind of thing. I know other websites do that all the time. Liz often sends me links to a, a website that does one quarterly or something like that. And the last one that I entered, oh, I failed so utterly. It was, <laughs> I failed worse on that one than I did in our own game here. Wow, really? Yeah. That's pretty bad. But, you know, who cares? That's it, pretty you, abject. Okay. That failure. All right, don't don't rub it in. <laughs> but uh, you know, even if you don't win the contest, I, I've always felt like there's something to be said for doing something just for the sake of doing it. Write just to write, and I know you're in agreement because you need to get those million. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. In today's dollars, it's now gone up to two point eight million. <laughs> it's actually words a billion of crap. words. I know I don't get better with every story, but I'll tend to learn something or I'll tend to say something different in almost every single story. And so that kind of thing, it, to me, it's always worth it. As long as I finish, if I... I think that was one of Heinlein's rules is you have to finish what you write. There you go. I think that was rule number one. No, I think number one was you had to write. And number oh, okay. two was you had to finish what you wrote. <laughs> okay. So that, that's, that makes good sense, I guess. And now a word from our sponsor... This winter, from the creators of Barbie Three Musketeers, Barbie Rapunzel, Barbie the Vampire Slayer, and Barbie Clockwork Orange comes... Only one doll was strong enough to survive whatever was thrown at her. Riches, power, and an entire toy aisle surround us. But what is it that is best in life? Gee, boss, I don't know. Barbie, enlighten Ken... What is best in life? Uh, shopping, a keen fashion sense, avoid bad hair days at all costs, and to crush the skulls of your enemies. Bobby, my child, there comes a time in life when gold loses its luster, when you look around you and wonder... This is boring me. Can I fight more brass skulls now? <laughs> 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 She was a slave. By Crumb, I will avenge your death, Ken. Then a gladiator. By Crumb, I will avenge your death, Skipper. Then a diplomat. By Crumb, I will avenge your death, Kelly. Then a slave again. By Crumb, I will avenge your death, Midge. 
And finally, a queen. By Crumb. Wait, who's Crumb again? Barbie the Barbarian. Coming this Hanukkah to DVD, Blu-ray, and Betamax. Oh, Hanukkah, oh, Hanukkah, the light, the menorah. Let's have a party, we'll all dance the horror. And coming next Grandparents' Day. I'd never hurt you, Skipper. I love you, don't you know that? Did Ken say I was going to hurt you? Here's Barbie! Shining Barbie! That's it, Rish. Nigel just turned off the show. Okay, so you've got a sandwich over there that I really know you want to eat, but I don't have that much... I can say about the story, I, w I would rather just ask you what you thought and let you talk and then, and, you know, just make snarky, unfunny comments when you don't need me to. Okay. Okay. Oh, no, okay. Chew your sandwich. One thing that it does need to be said, and I mentioned it when we read Liz's story. I don't think I mentioned it for the one last. Is that okay to call her Liz, by the way? We're supposed to call her Liz Lizanne. Lizanne. I think that's still short for Lizanne as well as it's short for any other name that might have Liz in it. Okay. I think I mentioned it for that one. I don't think I mentioned it on the last one. Uh, Next Place Fair wasn't a hard reading, really. It just was kind of a long story. And we tend to stay up really late doing these things. Like it is 1.39 right now a.m. Right. And I'm sure we'll go on much longer. But this story was hard. And the main reason were those names. Right. He gave us pronunciation guide just like Liz did. But every time I saw B-E-S-H-A-T, I wanted to say Bishat. And it was supposed to be pronounced... <laughs> Bishat. And so I, I have no idea. I, easily over an hour we spent reading this, right? Yeah. And I said... Was this the one that was like two hours, two hours and no, five minutes was, where it's like, Dax. I've got a gun in my mouth? <laughs> that was Dax that took that long. No, no, it wasn't. It was the one I kept falling asleep during. It was Plague Birds. That, that was wasn't. like the 2.8 hour long <laughs> reading. It was Dax. I'm telling you. Dax was fine. Dax we just did the other day. Uh, obviously, because it's Egyptian-ish, he had to have vaguely authentic sounding names. Right. But it just, it played to me. Phaeton. Uh, Gesundheit. <laughs> I, I have no idea. What, what is that? That was the full name of the uh, main character, Aram. Okay. Which I kept wanting to say. Aram, I kept trying to say with that That's one. Funny. And then Harum... I, I kept wanting to say harem. I don't know. I wanted them to rhyme because they looked like they should Aram rhyme. and harem, yeah. Aram and harem, but instead it was Aram and Harum. And then, of course, I kept saying Bishat just because, you know, that's what it should be. If, you, you, if you write Bishat, you need to say Bishat because, yes, I was Bishat at that point in the Gross. day. It had, uh, gotten, it, it had taken a long time to read the story, and I, I needed to go to the bathroom, but I didn't want to get up in the middle and... Ladies and gentlemen, the Parsec-nominated Doonstief team. So I suppose it was really difficult to edit this one because we'd stop and there start. There were a lot of stops and starts, and, yes. But if they had been Henry and Dave and trite 21st century little name like... Like January. What is wrong, dude? <laughs> then it wouldn't have felt right. So I guess it was necessary to have those really difficult to pronounce names. It's always difficult when you get to a fantasy type story like this one. This one wasn't high fantasy. The names weren't something like Gandalf or something, but they could have been. I mean, for all the difference it would have made. I mean, uh, Aramano Phaeton or whatever is not much easier to say than Gandalf. Names that aren't in the norm. Even if it was set in India or present day Japan or something like that. You know, it'd be just as hard, I would say. I would always come across something that I would want to say a different way than it actually is said. Yeah, and, and Ian, uh, this is in no way a criticism of the story. It's just difficult to do this. And then we've got another one that we may get to next week or maybe the one after that, which I think was even harder. And it had none of the problems with names. It's just when I'm unfamiliar with the way things are supposed to be said or the phraseology and stuff, it just, wow, it, it makes us earn our absolutely nothing. We're paying for this. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Sometimes you just can't even tell what the story is going to be that it, that is going to do that to you. But you'll start reading a story and you just trip over every sentence. You have to say every sentence five times or more. 
to get it out. And maybe it's just because it's the last story we're reading of the day or something. And it's now very late and you're just tired and you can't read straight anymore. Yeah, the beginning of our recording session, we try and do stuff for other people first. When somebody's asked us to do a voice or they've asked us to do retakes on another project. And then by the very end of the night, it takes something out of us. You know, I used to hear people say that when Guns N' Roses was actually a band that Axl Rose would, his voice would be completely shot by the third or fourth song of every performance at a concert, just because of the way he oh, sings. Yeah. His and screechy all that. voice. Duh. That's the reason why I can't listen to that band is because of the way he sings. Okay, so he was talking about game about interpreting that it's more than just a game in a looser manner. I think you would agree that the the way that people interpret these things is really amusing and fun and and what makes this worth doing, this little contest. Yeah, most definitely. Um, Be able to hear the different interpretations is very cool. I find it really interesting. You get to the end, that very last little chapter that we have when uh, the not-so-evil priest comes in and finds the very evil priest dead. The the lines that Aram has in that part, are they don't seem like the same Aram as we've had for the rest of the story. The whole time through, he's a very earnest and he just wants to do what's right, but he's also very... Uh, innocent and so forth and then all of a sudden he doesn't seem very innocent anymore in that very ending it's like oh it was bound to happen wow see i hadn't interpreted it that in way at all that's cool that you got a different uh impression uh-huh. from that but i think we both agree that there definitely was something supernatural going on i think so yeah i guess it could have been some sort of a coincidence but at the end he says the crown was flat there was no scorpion on there and somehow there's a scorpion elsewhere you know how could that be was he just seeing it wrong was he seeing the back side of the crown i would agree with you yeah this is a fantasy story and not just a straight up story whether it wants to be ambiguous and whether it wants to be ambiguous or not so hey, we're we're back, and you may not have noticed that we went anywhere, but uh, there was somebody wanted to use the television, and so we had to take a walk, even though it's winter. Yes, and it's how cold. cold would you say it is out there? It's not completely frigid. It's I'd say uh... your wife like the second month of your wedding. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> nothing, nothing. It's close to I would say it's right around thirty. Oh, so it seemed really, really cold. It's not after. freezing. It's not like 20 or 10 or something. I think it is actually technically freezing. Yeah, you're right. I guess you are right. That is freezing. 30 is uh, just under. But uh, yeah, I don't think it was seriously bad. It wasn't snowing or anything like that, at least. But Snow is warm. That's true. It was cold. And when you're out in 30 degrees for very long. Have we ever clocked how far our walk is every time? Now, t- now... We tend to have a sort of a tradition where we record a little bit and then when we start to stumble and I start to, you know, use lots of profanity and that, it's like, okay, it's time for our walk. Uh And we take a walk and and, and we go up the hill and down the hill and around the block and then back to We actually go up the hill and then come down the mountain. Oh, like Hugh Grant. (laughs) Hugh Grant. But it's it's miles, right? I don't know. You know, I was thinking that as we were walking today, I was thinking, you know, maybe we should get in the car, set the trip counter to, to zero, zero, and drive around and then stop and see. I'm sure our listener is hoping that we do that instead of recording right now. That's They probably are. Maybe we'll do that it, since we've already done our walk because they were using the TV. When we do start to stumble and have our trouble, we can do a drive of our walk and find out that how long it is. Let's say that it's only two miles, that it's exactly two miles. Okay. By about the one mile mark, I started to get really, really cold. Yeah. My face started, my face is still, it still kind of hurts or whatever that, that feeling when you, after you've been slapped or it stings, maybe the word I'm looking for is stings. Yeah. But I think of Gordon Matthew Sumner when I, somebody says Uh, that. Ah, yes. I think, uh, yeah, you're actually still kind of looking like somebody who's had Botox and so you're having a little trouble with the facial expressions because you must be still a little numb or something i'm not sure let's see i came out of the pod not entirely done uh but one thing that we did once it started getting cold is you know we would dance around and and you started to quote um 
a winger song <laughs> that I had no idea I even knew. But I, I, there was a song in the 80s that went, she's only 17, motherfucker. Uh, how does it go? Just like that. Okay, well, you do the next line because I don't. Daddy says she's too old, but she too. Wait, sorry. That's Sing completely it. the opposite. Daddy says she's too young, but she's old enough for me. I have not heard that song in years yeah. and years, but it, I knew that song, you know, <laughs> a younger version of me knew that song and I had no idea it was winger. And, and anyway, we were talking about the context of that song and, and, you know, we were kids when that came out. So 17 was like, cool. I like, like, <laughs> like to be with a girl at 17. Neat. She can drive. But now that, that you're an old fart and I'm watching you get old, 17 has this different connotation. And anyway, we were just talking and joking around and that, and we come around a corner and there's this dude. Uh, he's standing on his porch in a, a wife beater. <laughs> his hands are bloody from pummeling his common law girlfriend who is eight and a half months pregnant on a rocking chair, just taking off the gloves from mixing crystal meth in their, their own kitchen. And what does he say to us? <laughs> he says, hey, uh, guys, can you keep it down? Just just a little bit, and he held his fingers up close together. Just He just wanted us to bring it down, I guess, from 10 to 9. He had to put down the heroin needle to do that gesture with his hand, and he told us to keep it down. And how long would you say that we were absolutely <laughs> silent? We just walked down the street in silence yeah i just said oh yeah sure sorry and we yeah we walked it was a it was like two more blocks yeah it was like in, a f several football fields length we ran for two touchdowns before we said another word you kicked a field goal and then i started to laugh because it was so <laughs> surreal this was a a trailer bark scumbag telling us to hey keep it down man and we could hear people's teeth you're afraid that he's in our window? No, right no, now. no. I was just looking up to see what time it is. The time that he told us to keep it... It must have been, what, 9.30? We're walking by and talking loudly, and we've got to keep it down because it's 9.30 already. The kids are asleep. Weird. It, it was It's weird. not like it was 2 a.m. that we're walking by, and he's like, Hey, come on, man. And yeah, it, was, it wasn't Reverend James weird. or something like that, too. You know, And he's preparing his sermon, and he's like, <laughs> And therefore the Lord said... Were you quoting Winger? You know, none of, none of that. It was some douche. <laughs> I, I, he, he's running a brothel in his own basement. <laughs> and and you know, he's just outraged at our irreverence, I suppose. Anyway, I thought it was hilarious. And I couldn't explain why it was so funny to me. <laughs> but the fact that you and I acted like the librarian had shushed us or whatever. You know, we, we were a couple of kids and we're just, we're seething with, <gasps> teacher yelled at us. I... I I don't know. I found that very funny. Yeah, was, I know the audience won't find it funny, but oh gosh, Wendy, you're going to be so happy. To, we've got more outtakes for you, my dear. <laughs> we, you know, we didn't say a lot about May Rain Forever. Do you want to talk about why these episodes took so fucking long? Or is, is that just a given that it's that life got in the way? Disneyland. <laughs> Yeah, the, just the, a lot the, of things. The underage brothel from your uh, neighbor. Yeah, managing the underage brothel really got in the way. It took a, it took a lot of time. I had to go out shopping for wife beater t-shirts, tank tops. You can't really call those t-shirts, can you? That's you were the accountant for the brothel, <laughs> the, the money manager, and you know that kind of thing. Uh, well, okay, I, I, maybe I've been really hard on you about the whole episode editing things, but th there is no excuse for the Harry Potter thing. I did all of that, and they still didn't post it. But it's a new year. Let's just start fresh. It's 2011. What, what's going to happen in 2011, do you think? Are we going to be all right? Are we going to be all right? There will be no bodily injuries in 2011. Well, That's no. all I can promise. We'll see. If I'm as slow as I think Rish may finally be pushed over the edge and he'll put on the wife beater t-shirt and he'll start pummeling. But it'll be me that he's pummeling. Well, I see, I, I come from a place where one of the pastimes is righteous indignation. People ah. love to get together and judge others and say, I'm better than that person because of that. And so maybe I'm experiencing a little bit of it. And it is exhilarating to look at somebody <laughs> and say, I'm better than you. I edited a whole episode and you still didn't post it, motherfucker. Uh, we need to do a walk because I'm cursing. <laughs> <laughs> Already. We just barely got back from the last one. I know my face is still Botoxed out because of it. I don't know. We're not a weekly show. If we could be bi-weekly, maybe that would be enough. 
but uh, we've got stuff coming up that's already in the process of being edited, right? That's right. Yeah, we've actually had several people volunteer to produce stories for us, which is something that I've actually needed for a while. I just, I don't know what has changed that has made it so that I cannot keep up the way I was able to in the past, but I just... I can't. I can't do it. There's just things going on, and I can't. Man gets older. He can't keep up. There you go. Yeah. Maybe if I got one of those little blue blue pills, pills, I'd be able to edit more often, but just can't perform. (laughs) We've talked about our competitors, and I hate to say competitors. We've talked about our, what do you call the other people in the same line of work as you? That's probably not right, huh? We'll just call them contemporaries, uh, whatever the real word is. You, okay. Liz knows what the word is. Yeah. She could post it if she'd like. But Drabblecast is weekly. Uh-huh. And I think it's Thursdays or something like that. They're there every week. Right. And the Pseudopod, Escape Pod, you know, it, it is a rare week. That you miss when, them. That they're even a day late. That one show that you'll cut out the name of, <laughs> Starship Sofa, has like a four and a half hour show every six days. Uh, and see, I, I'm not sure how these things are possible. I, oh, oh, oh uh, you know, somebody we never mentioned, the Cast Macabre guy. Oh, uh-huh. Barry J. Northern, that guy, as far as I know, and I, I don't know because we're not intimate. Uh, but you will be. Well, anything for the English accent, sir. As far as I know, he does the whole thing by himself. Uh-huh. Most of the time he reads the story, he edits the story, he does music, he does, I think he does sound effects for the most part. And he uh-huh. does a, a beginning and an end and a... An outro, and he sings, and, and he dances, and he, he writes the theme tune, he sings the theme tune. That guy every week does it. Plus, he pays for these stories out of his own pocket. It just, the guy is a dynamo in the sack, but <laughs> I, I don't know how these things are done. Wait, you said you weren't intimate. Oh, no, no, no. I, the ladies have told me. Ah, oh, um, okay. I lined up for sloppy seconds. No slop to be had. They were quite content with Barry J. Northern. How is any of this going to make the episode? I <laughs> Usually around 1.30 in the morning, 2 in the morning, I get this punchy way where the things that I say tend to be a little more offensive than they are funny. I'm sorry. But we're but much earlier than that, so how, we're in for a long night. How do you think these people manage? Now, honestly, is it that it's a higher priority for them? Or do they have more free time? Do they have a crew that they just never talk about? Do That's they... possible. See, that's what I'm trying to develop is a crew, a J crew. What is J crew? Is that a, a, I think it's a label brand of... of clothing? I don't okay. know. A Columbus crew. What's that? It's a soccer team. How about a two live? Oh yes, that's crew. the kind of crew or, I'm. Or trying the to Motley develop. kind. Ooh, a Motley crew. That's crew with a U E, folks. Yes. And an umlaut over the U. Don't oh, forget. Oh, say umlaut. I umlaut. I just achieved Nirvana. There, listening to you say that. <laughs> uh, but the the folks that have volunteered, several of them even said it was a good experience. I've never heard a woman say that. Yes. Well, but. We're not speaking along those lines presently. Yeah, they said it was a good ex- They enjoyed it. They had fun doing this. So I think we might be able to get them to do it a second time and maybe even a third. And if we can get something like that going on, we could achieve dream control. We could achieve... End of line. We could achieve an actual, you know, close to weekly thing. There have been times that I, I think maybe it may have to do with priority or how excited you are about it or something like that that can keep you going even though you're using all your free time to do it i'm not sure what it is but it's just become difficult and i beg your pardon as long as i have my podcast that i maintain (laughs) and i can get those up regularly that's a hard word to say say it is it say it regularly was a hard word to say but maybe it is i cannot say it you know, I'm I'm all right because I have that outlet of creativity, and then I have my writing too, and wankery is kind of an outlet as well. Wankle rotary engine. <laughs> Anyhow, I guess this was supposed to be our hey, it's a new year, and usually when people make resolutions for a new year, whether they intend to keep them or not, I don't know. My friend Jeff has made this outrageous resolution. That is impossible. I, I know the man. There's no way he can can keep he it. Can, can keep it. And and I keep telling him that. And he's like, Why do you try and dissuade me? You know, I was like, well, be the Donald Duck with the harp. 
rather than the one with the pitchfork. <laughs> but, but some things are just ludicrous. I know that he's not going by, you know, by this third week of January, it's going to be long forgotten. Uh-huh. It would be me saying, I'm going to take Katie Holmes from Tom Cruise and, oh, there's going to be all sorts of lovely sex between us. This is not going to happen. Mm-hmm. She's got a comfortable life and no sex need be involved. Yes. I, <laughs> that does sound like a pretty nice setup. Every couple of years, the turkey baster has to come around. But, uh, you know, the, the... <laughs> I liked your description of that thing. It's the big thing and it's like this and the bubble. Even Wendy didn't like that part. <laughs> as far as uh, resolutions for the podcast go, I think we'll, we'll try and continue it as long as we can. Mm-hmm. And I've got a couple of ideas for things that I hope people find amusing. And, uh, you know, in, in 2010... Last we, year? Last year. It's, it's hard to remember, boy. It's been so Back many in aught years. 10. Uh, I don't think you can I, say aught 10. You wouldn't 10. say aught, would you? No, there's no aught involved. Although there is a two aught 10. True. In the, the, the year that's just ending, you know, we had some really good episodes. We did yeah. our longest ever episode this year, didn't we? The Cory Doctorow. That was two episodes. Well, right, but the longest story ever. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, another thing that was really neat is we had, like, Optimus Prime. We had some, oh, right, we had some right. celebrity guests we did. on the show. And uh, that was cool. That was cool. You know, speaking of that, 080T was telling me that he was trying to line up a celebrity guest for us. Why? Be, well, he just wanted the show to be better, I guess. He's, he's starting to get the spirit or something. I don't know. He, 080T. Yes, big guy, Clovis. Did you manage to get a, the celebrity guest here? Is he? Yes, he is here. This is the Rich Outfield we were talking about. Of course, I succeeded. Wow. So, what is he like hanging out in the green room then? He is at your front porch, shivering in the cold. Jeez, you left him out there? Holy crap. No, no, that's so weird. I swear I heard somebody at the door before and I just ignored it. You were afraid it was that dude and the wife, Peter, <laughs> weren't you? <laughs> it's like, I heard you guys podcasting about me. I told you guys to be quiet, damn it. I was making some gin popsicles out of my wife's special place. And you, oh, I was like, oh, goodness okay, gracious. Sir, please. <laughs> sir, please is right. <laughs> okay, hey, it. O- o- O-8-O-T. Yes. So O-8-O-T, he's here. Yes. So, so it is definitely a he. Yeah, because you yeah. know you're, just, just, you're gonna actually you're gonna be excited about this. This is oh you know who it is. Yeah, this is somebody that you're a fan of. Really? Should I should I guess who 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 it might be, or, or should we just um, Neil Patrick Harris? Close. Well, close in a way. <laughs> close in a way. Okay, so somebody that I am a fan of, right? Uh huh. Wait, somebody that sings. Is that that how it's close? I don't think he sings. Okay, so so he's a celebrity. Yes. Okay, wait. You made a funny face. Oh, so it's somebody that I that I'm really into. Is it is it is it Bill Shatner? Is it close? You're getting closer. Close, close to Bill Shatner. Should we just open the door? What do you think, uh, announcer man? We have to do it. All right. Can you buzz him in then, Oedo T? It's about bloody time. I'm sorry. We guess we did milk that. Hello. All right, so? Yes. Huh? Wait, wait. <laughs> it's George Takei. That's Patrick right. Shatner and he, oh, yeah. Oh, and, wow. and he's kind of, yeah, like Neil Patrick Harris in a way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, well, yes, welcome, George Takei. So, well, uh, Mr. Takei, how, how is it that... How is it that you got booked on our show? Oh, my. <laughs> uh, Mr. Takei, you know R-O-8-O-T? That's right. Wow. Yeah, he O8OT said that he knew him and and he was going to get him on here cuz he wanted him to uh, come and say a few words. He he knew that you were a fan, so I am a fan. <laughs> Thank you. I have been to a Star Trek convention. I've actually seen you at a convention before and uh, although I don't think we've met. Uh, it's an honor to have you us on on See, I'm stuttering. I'm that nervous. <laughs> it's like a pretty girl in a karaoke bar. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Yes. He came because he wanted to share a word with you. I played him part of the show, and he said he had to come on and talk to you. To to us? He wanted to talk to you specifically, Rish. Oh, cool. Yes. I I, I can pull up here with the microphone. You can take mine. What do you have to say? You are a douchebag. What? That's right. 
a douchebag. Wait, 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 why? I'm not, I'm, I'm not one of those things. Now that's ridiculous. <laughs> you are always going to be a total douchebag. Thank you very much. Oh. No, no, don't go. Oh. That's, that's too bad that that's all he had to say to you, man. I what? guess you can't always get a hug from... No, that was Richard Simmons that you got the hug from, huh? I was going to say Shatner. You got to feel up in some way or another, but you got an erection from Shatner in one way or another, didn't you? <laughs> At least I'm capable of getting an erection. Oh. Grandpa. Uh, hey, R.A.T., um, eat it, dude. Suck it long and suck it hard. Why would you do that, man? I just wanted to bring on someone that you love. And have them spit on you. <laughs> it's the least that you deserve, Rich Outfield. Okay. Looks like... I, I, you know, I, I'm making a prediction for 2011. New robot assistant. <laughs> You're going to try and bring back ADRG. That guy was cool. He was cultured. <laughs> he was intellectual. He participated he was in the conversation. He Come on, admit it. <laughs> oh, T is a butt licker. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe we can do better in 2011. Maybe we'll have more celebrity guests. I mean, we've already got one. No, no, no. I'm going to make a blanket statement right now. Uh, no more celebrity guests in 2011, <laughs> please. Oh, okay. I guess we can we'll go, go out on the bottom. The last thing I wanted to say was uh, these are brand new microphones. Yeah, we're not really sure how this is going to turn out. We'll have to see how this goes. Uh, we're just trying them out. These, <laughs> these my daughter got with a video game for uh, Christmas. And so I thought, hey... These go in stereo. I'm going to try this out. This could really help. So we'll have to see. Maybe Plus, we... these have USB ends, so you can yes, plug them right, right into the computer. And we were worried that part of the problem was that we had all these cords, a couple of them frayed. And I also got brand new microphones from Santa, from Richard Simmons, oddly <laughs> enough. He said he, he wanted said, to thank you for last night. and. <laughs> I just said, uh, you know, gosh, I sure would like to have the capability to record without somebody saying, oh, that's the world's crappiest recording. And he appeared and said, I'm your I'm dream maker. <laughs> that's for you folks who've been listening from the beginning. But no, seriously. They had actually a big, long montage videos of Rish speaking on his crappy old mic and they'd play the recordings of it and he would hang his head in shame and he was just so sad but by the end of the video i was moved i mean i was crying there were all these hefty <laughs> black women in the audience shaking their head and they had brought handkerchiefs <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Rish was jumping up and hugging, and I, it was something special. I talked about that show, right? <laughs> yes. That's what it was like. Is It was designed to make, make people cry. cry and, and not just make pe me cry, but mostly to make like middle-aged women cry. Hefty women. <laughs> it's, it's fair to say yes. <laughs> because Richard Simmons is all, was all about fitness and, and right. all that stuff. So, you know, there'd be like a woman whose dream was to lose 100 pounds for her girl's gra high school graduation or something. You know what I mean? And Richard Simmons would do these things, you know. Would uh, wave his magic wand and poof. He would poof, yes. <laughs> but uh, he would do these things and we would watch the video. You know, it, it was one of those daytime talk show kind of things. And it was harmless. I, I know I've talked about it with a little bit of nostalgia. It was something that I was ashamed to be on the first day and proud to be on the second day, you know. I'm, why the f are we talking? I about? don't know. You're the one that went way into it. I was just throwing out a stupid joke, and all of a sudden, you're doing a whole episode on it. <laughs> let's get to K. Let's get to K back in here. Okay. Well, I'm I'm sorry. I just, we we were trying out new microphones. I've got a new microphone. Yeah. And we haven't been able to use it on the show yet. But sometime in the new year, uh, maybe I'll record a sketch with it or something like that, and uh -huh. we can see if it sounds good. See if it sucks. We'll see if these suck. Hopefully, they work. Hopefully, they're not like automatically have a special echo filter automatically put on them or something like that. That could be bad. For the past 20 minutes, the show has been <laughs> even more unlistenable it's than it normally is. star filter on it or something. Because <laughs> these are for the karaoke PlayStation games. So. Dude, after we're done podcasting, can we play that karaoke? We could, but it's the High School Musical 3 karaoke game, so mm -hmm. I don't think I'd really stand a chance against you because you know all the songs inside and out, and I don't... You're mean. <laughs> I am. <laughs> All right. First to K, then you, and then the friggin' robot, of course. This looks like the start of a beautiful year. Yes. It's going to be good. 
So yeah, that's our final story in the Broken Mirror 2010 edition. The uh, the big winner. May he reign forever. This one was my choice. I, I picked it as my number one story. I think, I don't know what out of ten I gave it, but I did think, yeah, this one should be the winner. And so... I'm glad that everyone else agreed with me, or most everyone else, enough to give it the same thing. That makes me feel like I'm smart. Uh, because I am. This is the sound of me patting you on the head. <laughs> so thank you for not just Nathaniel, but all of the people who entered the contest. I hope that our picking these three stories doesn't make the rest of you feel like losers. You're not. I was the loser. <laughs> He's um, right. And will continue to be. I'm here. I've been placed on this earth to make you feel better about yourselves. But Everyone's thank you. Everyone's got a purpose in life. Yeah, there you go. Thank you for sending those in, for working so hard, for thinking about the premise and giving it your level best. And uh, I think we've mentioned in every episode, all of you out there are free to read the stories. They are available in text form just there on the right side of the screen on dunesteef.com. There's a link to them. You can go on and read every one, decide which one you like best. Have the fun of seeing how people interpreted yeah. those few words. You could tell us how wrong our choices were because the other one was better that we didn't pick. Uh, I don't want them to do that. Mm. I have tell a very thin skin. <laughs> but hopefully you feel that it has been an enjoyable trip and that we'll have even more people participate in next year's Broken Mirror story event if uh, if we make it that long. <laughs> and uh, thank you. I'm going to let you make yourself another sandwich. Okay. Well, hey, we've come to the end of uh, another episode of The Dune Steve. Yes, The Dune Steve has come to an end. You named the podcast, right? I did. What does that word mean, The Dune Steve? It's actually uh, named after a person. His name was David Dune Steve. A, a, a person in history? Or yeah. Yeah. Yeah, David Doonstief was the man who offered to be the human test subject for the first polio vaccine. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. And did he did he survive? Was he all right? I don't know. You wrote the script. Oh, okay, <laughs> let's, let's move on. <laughs> I'm off to make another sandwich. Thanks for listening, folks. I'm Big Anklovich. I'm Big. <laughs> no, you're not. Not Big at all. I'm Little Anklovich. This is, uh, I was weird. I forgot my name. <laughs> Outfield. Rish Outfield. Thanks for listening, folks. At the Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, we pay our authors. So if you love good fiction and want to see it continue, please donate. The Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. Take two. And you come before us now with your laughable demands. Ha! I laugh again. Ha! Mine is an evil laugh. I, I, I don't have anything. You say something, please. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to start with? Let me interrupt. Is that the spirit of Christmas? No, that's a plate that's just the spirit of the rest of the year. That's the ug that, that makes the spirit of Christmas plate look like a work of art. <laughs> what, what has happened to that plate? The spirit of Christmas or that one? That's what, that one there. What did it use? To, what color was it at one time? And what has happened to it? I, I don't know, man. I'm not one that understands the decorating of women. So putting a plate up with some distress marks, I believe, is what they call that stuff. It's distressed. But it's not art. And it's not a sculpture. It is, it is a, plate. a plate. And it's not China. No. It's a tin plate spray painted over. And the way I know it's spray painted over is you can see the places where the paint has chipped off. That's the distressing. That's what's cool. Well, it, it is distressing to see that you, <laughs> you worked an hour overtime so that that could. Anyway, I hope that Wendy is enjoying this talk. Bay shat. Bay shut. How can be shat be pronounced bay shut? He be shat himself. Come on.
Arumanu Faitan. Arumanu Faitan. Arumanu Faitan. Arumanu Faitan. Arumanu Faitan. You don't even have to say it. I know, but I'm going to say it over and over again so you won't screw it up. Arum? Arum? How was his name? Arum. You're going to say it about 500 times, so. Arum, just say it. Arum. Arum. It's not Arum, but it's Arum. There was a silence as Arum squinted at ha- Arum. There was a silence as Ar- <sighs> All these names, man, they kill me. Palm fronds waved and incense smoked as Arum. <sighs> I always want to say Arum. Just start saying Arum now. <laughs> Let me just change it each each time there's a scene change. I'll call him Aram next time. Not me. I don't give a bishat. Even as Harum puffed up behind up. Oh, these two names should rhyme. Damn it. But they're not spelled <laughs> even remotely. Well, they are A-R. Har- it's Harum and Aram. Even as Harum, you know Harum... Even as Harum puffed up behind Ar- Aram. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to laugh. That is treason, Lord Bishat. Bishat. That is treason, Lord Bishat. Bishat. That is treason, Lord Bishat. Harum sounded as though he were trying to swallow a river frog. How in the crap do I prefer? Boom. That gleam held Harum's attention more solidly than the plethora of nubile dancers who bowed and swayed in what should have been a most distracting manner. Aram, true to form, appeared bored by the proceedings. You see, Aram was quite gay. He just hadn't come out of the closet just yet, because he's only ten. We can give him a minute. Beishat slapped his copious belly, sending visible waves across it. Wait, you need a copious belly to be able to get the right sound. Let's try that again. Yours is long gone, sir. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) That was the sound. Sorry. (laughs) Copious. All right, I'll give it to you first in a relatively normal voice. A child? What nonsense is this? Where is the real king? Okay, and I'll give you the uh, big, booming, Santa Clausy kind of voice. A child? Um, what are you doing here? I, I had thought you were occupied. I was just getting rid of some troublesome douchebags. I... It's too noisy in here with everyone talking. Bay shit, go outside and wait. Bay shut. Go outside and wait, okay? It is a pleasure to speak with you. Oh, fuck, here's that name. Aramanu Phaeton. Aramanu Phaeton. Ah, fuck it. All right. King Aramanu Phaeton. King Aramanu Phaeton. King Aramanu Phaeton. That's not right. King Aramanu Phaeton. Oh, now I understand how you guys feel about Popoka. Oh, it's almost done. Yeah. I have only farted twice. Oh. Thrice. <laughs> Quadrice. Is there such a word? I don't know. I like <laughs> it then. One of the ibises from the sacred garden was roosting on the ledge. Basha ignored it, resuming his pacing. You don't think it's actually ibises, do you? I don't care if it is. <laughs> I'm not saying but... that. I'm not saying that. There's no way. Perhaps we might induce the crocodiles to feed, Harum said carefully, by giving them scraps. They are quite terrifying when they are roused. Terrifying is good, said Aram. Murdered by pirates is good. (laughs) There was a snap and a splash of water that made Aram squeal happily. (laughs) Gross. His arms windmilled as he staggered backwards, spun and stumbled. Ah! Again, without hitting your knee on the bottom of the table. Nope. Okay. Beisha took a moment in the relative brightness of the antechamber. Bishat took his moment and bishat himself. He found that his robe was bishat. Yeah. Because my romantic adventures 
are so pathetic compared to yours. You, <laughs> you only having sex with one woman in a night is considered a failure. And me, a woman actually tells me good night instead of just walking away. It's like a minor success. Uh, by, by crumb, I will avenge your death, Ken. By crumb, I will avenge your death, Skipper. By crumb, I will avenge your death, Kelly. By crumb, I will avenge your death. Well, Midge, I guess you only get two. I'd never hurt you, Skipper. I love you. Don't you know that? And did Ken say I was going to hurt you? Red ram. Crashing sound. Here's Barbie. Shining Barbie. Barbie.